Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 470 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by a former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week? I'm doing great, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. We're going to dive straight into the review part of the show. We're going to start here in Germany. Uh, this one was last Saturday at the Firat Arslan Sports Center over here, Eddie. Firat Arslan. <laughs> there we go. He topped the bill. He promoted the card. And like I say, fought in the main event in his own arena. He's now 56 and 9 with three draws. A knockout win for him in the second round against Angel Ledesma, now 13 and 6 with a draw. He'd, he'd, he'd been coming off a year out the ring, stepped back in. Nice, quick, early knockout for, for Firat Arslan. Um, moving now to the Aichi Sky Expo in Japan. Over here, we saw Sivanafi Nonchinga lose his IBF light flyweight world title he's now 13 and 2 he was actually stopped tko'd in the ninth by masamichi yabuki who's now 17 and 4 the new ibf fly light flyweight world champion um moving now to i suppose well i'm gonna get these small cards out of the way no disrespect obviously to the uh to the japanese boxing scene but I want to get these smaller cards out of the way before we move to the big one this one went down on Sunday at the Ariaki Arena in Tokyo Japan we saw the brother of Naoya Takuma Inoue lose a unanimous decision over 12 rounds he's now 20 and 2 a loss there to Seiya Tsutsumi who's now 12 and 0 with two draws also on that card Kenshiro Taraji moved to 24 and 1 a TKO for him in the 11th round against former champion Christopher Rosales now 37 and 7 that one for the vacant flyweight WBC world title um that was that one there on Sunday. Moving now to the same, well, not moving, staying in the same arena, but, you know, fast forward in 24 hours because they had a card on Sunday and Monday in the same venue, the Ariaki Arena in Tokyo, Japan. On this card on the Monday, we saw Junto Nakatani move to 29 and 0, defense there of his WBC Bantamweight World title, a TKO for him in the sixth against Tasana Salapat, now 76 and 2. And. Also on that card, Kosi Tanaka lost a split decision over 12 rounds. He lost his WBO Super Flyweight World title. Tanaka now 20-2. and two. In the other corner, Fumalele Cafu now 11-0 and 0 with three draws. Another close fight for him. He always winds up finding himself in close fights. And like I say, a split decision win over 12 rounds there for Cafu. Um... Moving now then to the big one, it went down, of course, at the Kingdom Arena in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It was live on DAZN pay-per-view. Let's get into the undercard first. Um, this one was interesting. I know you didn't see this, Eddie, so it's a great shame because I would have loved to have heard your opinion on it. But Ben Whitaker, the showman, now 8-0 and with a draw. Liam Cameron, now 23-6 and with a draw. Um... It was for the IBF International and, and, and the WBO Global Light Heavyweight title, which was vacant. Whitaker unable to continue after having sustained an injury when both boxers fell from the ring. They went over the top rope. I'm guessing you've took yourself off mute. You must have saw it. No, I was like, what happened? I was like, I'm, obviously I'm ah, listening now, but okay. I was like, what the hell did he, what, what, you know, but now, now that you're talking about it, okay, I'm just going to listen. Yeah, so basically it was like a you know the, the biggest step up of Whitaker's career. He was still a massive favorite. He was one to fifty with the bookies, which means you got to bet fifty dollars to win one dollar. So even though it was a big step up, 
um, as a pro, obviously, from what he's done in the amateurs, from the way his pro career has gone thus far, it's been pretty much punch perfect. So they expected him to beat Liam Cameron with ease. Um, it turned out that it was a much tougher fight than anyone expected for Ben Whitaker. So some people at the time of the stoppage had it like 3-1 to Cameron. Um, I think some people even scored, like partially scored the fifth round because um, that was the round that, you know, the, well, that was the final round, I guess, you know, yeah, I guess, you know, the fight had, or, or the round that ended, because pretty much, you know, the round ended, the, 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 uh, the, the, the bell went for the end of that fifth round, and then that's where the pair tangled up and went over the top rope, and, um, it was Liam Cameron that went over, sort of, you know, went over backwards, um, and upside down, and Ben Whitaker was on top of him, and he, you know, went over as well frontwards, you know, so bizarre situation. I don't really think there was anyone that you could point the finger at. It was just like a freak incident and they go over and of course, um, Liam Cameron, you know, I would have thought would have had the harder landing because he goes down with Ben Whitaker on top of him, but Ben Whitaker lands and just off of the camera, you couldn't quite see it with the replays, even in slow motion from the different angles. You couldn't quite see where his right foot ended up. And um, he claimed that he couldn't continue because something was wrong with his foot. Since the fight, it's come out that he apparently sprained his ankle. Um, a lot of people are criticising him heavy. They were doing it on the night, the commentary team. They were doing it in the studio. Um you know, they they feel like he potentially tried to find a way out and successfully found a way out in a fight that he was losing, like I say, maybe 3-1, maybe 4-1, depending on whose scorecard you pay attention to. Um, I didn't think Liam Cameron had as much success as some people did. I wasn't scoring it, but in the end, it goes down as a technical decision draw or something like that I can't quite remember the ruling it was a weird thing it was like a a technical draw but also a a, a split technical decision draw something mad like that I believe one judge had it to Whitaker, one judge had it to Cameron one judge had it a draw so it was a yeah it was a it was a weird I can't even remember what it was now but anyway it goes down as a draw um and yeah Ben Whitaker like I say a lot of people now are starting to wonder what is going on you know what 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 is going on maybe he's just not as good as we thought he was um there's a lot of smart you know smart smart asses I'm gonna say that are coming out saying yeah you know <laughs> I knew this was gonna be a tough fight I knew this and I knew that and you know those um after time and says they're called in the business i suppose uh that's what steve bunce would say <laughs> um so yeah there's a lot of people looking back in hindsight and you know after experts and all the rest of it i didn't think this was going to be a tough fight for ben whitaker i felt ben would win i felt that ben could potentially stop uh liam cameron become the first man to stop him but i was wrong i was wrong and it was a tougher fight than than you know anyone expected but like i say it had only gone five rounds it was a 10 rounder there was still a long way to go in the fight um and you know i wasn't scoring it like i say but for me um it was it was far from done i don't think ben would have tried to look for a way out in my honest opinion i don't think you know, it was too early on in the fight. It was too early on in the fight for me to feel like um, he, he tried to find a way out. Like, I really doubt he would have been thinking as soon as he lands, you know, on his leg or whatever, or, or whatever he landed on, I, I really doubt that he would have thought, hang on, I'm losing this fight 4-1. I need to find myself a way out of this fight because I'm probably going to lose. I, I doubt it. It all happened very quickly. Obviously, he stayed down. Liam Cameron got back up and went to the other corner and, you know, was was getting ready for the next round while Ben couldn't continue. And like I say, it was a bizarre ending to a bit of a crazy fight. Uh, also on that card, Sky Nicholson moved to 12-0, to, uh, and 0, a unanimous decision over 10-2s, as expected, really, against Raven Chapman, who's now 9-1. and 1. She loses her O. It was a defense there of Nicholson's WBC featherweight world title. Friend of the show, Nicholson, happy for her. I did say on last week's show, this fight here, I think the clash of styles will be interesting. It could pretty much catch light from the first round. Um... 
it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be, to be honest with you. I think that that was probably because of Sky Nicholson. I think she she was able to box at range and use her feet. And Raven Chapman wasn't really too good at cutting off the ring and getting up close. She just couldn't really do her best work, to be honest with you. And when the fight was fought at long range, it was completely Sky Nicholson's contest. So... Quite a wide win for Sky Nicholson in the end. A dominant performance. I don't think she hurt Raven Chapman at any point or anything like that. But a good win. A good fight for women's boxing. History making, obviously, being in Saudi as well. Um, but yeah, she moves on, Sky Nicholson. And Raven Chapman, even though she's took a loss there, I think she could still be involved in some great fights. Also on the card, Chris Eubank Jr. moved to 34-3. and three, A KO win for him in the seventh round against Camille Serrameta, now 25-3 and three with two draws. He's been stopped in all three losses to Gennady Golovkin, to Jaime Munguia, and to Chris Eubank Jr. Um, he's been stopped in either round six and seven as well against all those guys. So seems to kind of be the same pattern for Serrameta. Even though he'd been on a decent little run of late, but against lower-level guys... You know, he steps up and around about the midway point, he seems to fall apart. Um, that one was for the IBO middleweight world title. Chris Eubank Jr. with a win. But like I say, just just not really interested in this fight before or after it. And I'm not really interested in what comes next for Chris Eubank Jr. I think someone tweeted it the other day. For me, I agree with this tweet, by the way. Someone tweeted saying that Chris Eubank Jr. is the most successful, unsuccessful boxer ever. And I think that's a brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, sentence. I, I agree with it 100%. Never won a world title. Extremely unlikely that he ever will win a world title. And he's made a boatload of money, basically, I guess, being his father's son, maybe. You know, he can fight. I think there was a point in his career where he was probably capable of winning a world title, but... He just seems to fight these same types of guys and they just don't do nothing for him. I don't understand it, to be honest with you, but whatever. All the best to him. Uh, also on the card, Fabio Wardley moved to 18-0 and with a draw. A TKO in the very first round against Fraser Clark. Now 8-1 and with a draw. A rematch here, obviously, for the British and Commonwealth heavyweight titles. What a shock this was. No one expected it to end in a round, especially after the two men had gone 12 rounds last time out. It was an instant rematch. Um, yeah, what can I say? It was over very, very quickly. You know, Fabio Wardley went in there, um, met Fraser Clark head on. Um, I I'm just going to kind of have to talk about the finish because there wasn't too much else to, to, to really talk about. Like I say, a uh, fast start from Fabio Wardley. And there was a moment where they were both trading and, 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 and Fraser Clark was kind of in the corner a little bit. And Fraser Clark um, got caught with a big shot, kind of got staggered back to the ropes and then Wardley went in for the kill. Fabio Wardley seemed to still have his senses about him because he threw a nice little counter uppercut off the ropes as well, kind of come under the guard of Wardley, caught him with a counter shot. But in the, in the midst of all that, there was more punches raining in from Fabio Wardley. One punch seemed to... Uh, catch Fraser, Fraser Clark and Fraser Clark winded up with his back to Wardley and he kind of fell into the ropes forward into the ropes kind of thing the referee then didn't jump in and make him turn around to face the right way and then continue I felt like the referee Victor Lachlan could have probably jumped in and said stop boxing and let him turn back round but basically he turned back round quite slowly I think Fraser was probably wondering why the referee hadn't jumped in at that point or whatever. He kind of turned turn round and, you know, obviously you've got to defend yourself at all times in that ring. But Fabio Wardley took advantage of Fraser Clark kind of being a little bit slow in his reaction. So he turns round, referee's just standing there looking at Fraser Clark, not actually jumping in or anything. Um, Fabio Wardley catches him with a really big shot and then about three or four punches later, the fight's over. Um, Fraser Clark ended up getting hit with a shot. It was a massive, massive right hand to the jaw slash cheek of Fraser Clark. Um, it was scary scenes because Fraser Clark literally had a dent punched into his head. 
Um, it was very scary, and again, the replay on TV was quite, quite, um, yeah, it was quite grim. Actually, it was uh, if you're squeamish, maybe don't watch it if you haven't, if you haven't seen it. But yeah, brutal, brutal knockout. His jaw was all pushed to one side while his face was straight, and he had a dent in the side of his head. Um, it looked like he'd had a stroke. A lot of people have been saying that, and that is a very accurate description. It was a scary expression on Fraser's face. Um, it's come out that there's a suspected broken cheekbone and broken jaw. So um, it just goes to show, I suppose, how hard Fabio Wardley hits. And um, yeah, you know, like I say, it was over before you knew it. And what a shame. What a shame for Fraser Clark. Um, great stuff for Fabio Wardley because obviously if you have a really hard 12 round fight that ends in a draw, you know, a grueling fight, which it was the first fight, you want to go back in there and get the second fight done as quick as possible so you can move on and forget all about this chapter of your career. Um, not not forget all about it because it's a good win. Of course it is on paper. It's a fantastic win. But you want to move past this and not have to fight someone who can give you absolute nightmares again. So that's what Fabio Wardley will do. There's going gonna, there's gonna to be no third fight. Fraser Clark, though, is kind of left in a bit of a tough position. Obviously, he's up there in age and stuff. Um, you know, he's, he's still a capable fighter. I just hope he can fully recover from this 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 uh, crushing defeat the other night. And, um, and yeah, you know, like I say, he's in a bit of a difficult spot because Fabio Wardley hasn't yet kind of proven that he's actually past domestic level. So what does Fraser Clark do? It's a good question, and I'm not entirely sure what the answer is at this point. Um, Fabio Wardley moves on. There's a lot of big fights for him out there. I think there was mentions of a possible Jared Anderson fight for him. I'd like to see it. I don't think we're going to see it, but I'd, I'd definitely like to see it. But there's a lot of guys out there for Fabio Wardley. And um, yeah, all the best to him moving forward. Moving up the card once again, Jai Apatai, friend of the show, moved to 26-0. and A successful defense of his IBF Cruiserweight World title. A sixth round TKO against Jack Massey, now 22-3. and Very game, Jack Massey. It's nothing that we didn't already know. Like I say, I, I feel like a broken record now. I've been beating the drum and hyping him up for a long, long time. Very good fighter. Really poorly managed, I think... A massive underachiever thus far in his boxing career. Very capable, but ultimately not quite, you know, at that level to mess with a Jaya Pattaya. So it was a one-sided beatdown for Jaya Pattaya. He busted Jack Massey up quite early on in the fight. And, you know, if you've seen one round of the fight, then you've seen the whole fight pretty much. Because it was just more and more and more of the same. He, he was, you know, beating him up more and more and more as the fight went on. And in the end... Joe Gallagher threw the towel in, which I think was a very good stoppage from Joe Gallagher, who in the past has been criticised for not throwing the towel in. You know, I remember he was in the corner with uh, Marcus Morrison a few years ago. Can't remember what fight it was now, but there's been a few times where Joe Gallagher, you know, he's been quite brave in that corner, which I don't always like to see. And um, this time, I think he got it. He got it quite right. You know, he threw that towel in, saved Jack Massey for another day. Um, I'm hoping that Jack Massey, again, can can fully recover from this because it was a bit of a beat in there through six rounds. I think most people expected a stoppage late on, but like I say, Jai Opatai did get the stoppage in the first half of the fight, so a nice win for him. Credit to Jack Massey. Like I say, I hope he did get nicely paid for that one, but um, yeah, it was a nothing fight really for Jai Opatai. didn't make too much sense, and I guess he's just going to be trying to wait around for the winner of Chris Billum smith and Gilberto Ramirez. Moving up to the main event then, this one for the undisputed light heavyweight titles, uh, the IBF, IBO, WBC, WBO, WBA, Artur Baturbiev, 20-0 going in, he's now 21-0, a majority decision over 12 rounds against Dimitri Bivol, now 23-1, quite controversial. Um, in, in a lot of people's eyes, it was a close fight though in everybody's eyes, I think, um, what can I say here? I mean, most people already expected Dimitri Bivol on points or Baturbiev knockout. No one really expected Baturbiev to win on points. No one really expected Bivol to stop Baturbiev. Those were quite unlikely. Like I say, you could get really good odds for those two there, but 
No one really expected Baturbiev to win on points, and that is what happened in the end, a majority decision. I don't know if you scored it. It'd be interesting if you did. And I will as well go through my scorecard, because I did score it round by round um, when I was watching it the other night live. But I'll do that in a moment. Tell me what you thought about this really good chess match between the two best light heavyweights in the world. Well, Joe, honestly, uh, it was an interesting fight for sure. I mean, uh, you know, I, there was a lot of expectations going into it. Honestly, I think, uh, you know, everybody, you know, the contrast of styles was was, was great with Bibble being the boxer and, and, and you know, better better uh, better be of being more the uh, you know the the, the pressing in your face guy that could punch really hard, and it lived up to that to to a degree. But I, I mean, I, you didn't see the drama that kind of what you would think would go into a fight like that. You didn't see like Dimitri Bivol get dropped two or three times, or him get dropped even once and then come back and win the next two rounds, and you know, or you didn't see that happen to Berterbiev. You don't, you didn't really see a lot of those types of things happen. The fight was just back and forth pretty much the entire fight. I think where Bivol kind of messed up was in the last few rounds i think he 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 then what was the what's the word i want to use he used that uh he kind of came on at times very like you know kind of off the gas how do i how do i say what's that word i'm looking for so um, he was like oh punch like punching in spots he was using that a little bit too much he was doing it a little too much he would allow but so we have to just to, just to keep the pressure on i'm not saying allow like he didn't he couldn't like like you know he was just oh I'm gonna let him punch you know but so better Bev was was throwing some heavy shots everything he threw I'm pretty sure hurt or at least he felt it so he had to respect it so I think the reason that he was doing a lot of what he was doing was because I feel like he had to and he probably did you know get a little tired a little worn down from the extra work that uh, Better Be was doing, love the shots he was landing on him, you know, hitting his arms, hitting him. You, know, you can even see when he landed the shots, and like he would go like a whole foot back every time he was hitting him. You know what I mean? But I mean, a lot of it was because he was also moving. But um, I just really think that it, 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 he gave it. He put himself in that position to where he they could they could take the fight or they could give it to Better BM. If they needed a if it was like razor thin, like could have been a draw, that what he did in those last few rounds by coming off the gas a little too much is what I think gave uh gave the fight to Better BF a little more than what I think it because I thought honestly <clears throat> watching it, I could see how they could give the fight to Better BF, but I thought that he landed the cleaner, uh, clearer shots over the course of the fight. And I thought early on he got a, a decent lead early, but then, you know, obviously better be have came on late. But I thought that even as he was coming on, I thought he was landing the clean, cleaner shots. I wanted to see, you know, I picked better be have. So obviously you want your pick to, <laughs> you know, your, your pick to come out. But when you want, when you're watching the fight, you also want to see the, the person who deserves the win win the fight. Now, I'm not saying that uh, better be of them deserve to win the fight because I think he did. I think he went and got it in the end, even though I thought the clearest shots were landed by uh, Bevel, but I just think that he was a little too lax. And I don't want to say lax like he could have done so much more because, you know, he, he put forth, I think, a hell of an effort. He, he boxed really well. He landed some good shots. He even got the respect of better be of at times. But I just think at the end of the fight, he was in his face. He was like, I'm going to hit you. I'm going to, you know what I mean? I'm going to wear you down. And I think eventually he started to wear it down and, uh, at the end of the fight. And I think that was really, at the, at the, end, of the, the end of the fight was a real difference. I mean, I, I think the beginning of the fight, obviously, uh, uh, Bivol controlled it. But you can't, you can, you can't, you can start great but you got to finish great as well and if you want to really seal it and i think in this situation he just didn't really do that um a very interesting fight though you know and it was it was it was great to see how better be at the end of the fight really wanted it and went after it and you know a guy like him who typically doesn't you know win by decision or he gave his his first decision win 
You know what I mean? He normally knocks people out within, you know, uh, a certain amount of rounds. So to to see him go the distance and actually at the end of the fight pick it up and win it like that is a good thing for him. It's a good thing to see. And obviously, you know, he's, he's been in boxing for, you know, most of his life. But he hasn't had in the last, I don't know how many years he's been, you know, as he's been pro, he hasn't had the opportunity or really where he had to go get it. And to see him do it was 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 refreshing. So if you're a, if you're a fan of his, that's a good thing to see. And and uh, you know, so I'm really just interested now where his fight's going to go. I mean, where these two are going to go, whether they're going to fight again, there's a rematch clause, or <clears throat> or if they're just going to go in opposite directions and you know fight in different weight classes, fight different guys. I don't know. But it it, it would be interesting to go again. But I don't know if anybody would want to see it. Um, it's just you know it wasn't that exciting like i said it didn't really have the drama in it um but yeah it was it was interesting enough you know what i mean i'll watch it again but that's because i'm a box <laughs> i'm a boxing guy and i'm pretty sure joe you would watch it again but that's because you're a boxing guy but it, the thing is to get people who don't typically watch boxing all the time they're probably tuned in to watch and if it's not any real drama, anything overly exciting, no bleeding, no this, no that, no knockdowns, then it's going to be hard to get a regular person to want to watch that again. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you ended on that point there because actually I noticed on Twitter that Clarissa Shield said that the fight wasn't that good. And I was like, what? Like, what? How was it? I couldn't I couldn't understand that. I'm not that surprised. Um yeah, very, very good fight. Um, you've pretty much done all of the work, really, in, in, in reviewing it there, Eddie. There's not too much for me to add to it. Um, obviously, you know, Baturbiev, when when on the front foot, was was, was quite lethal. Um, but... Sorry about that, Joe. I didn't mean to, <laughs> I didn't mean to leave you with that to say, bro. But go ahead. Go ahead. Do your thing. Yeah. Um, no, v- very good fight, like I say. Um yeah, you know, when when Baturbiev was on the front foot, he was he was he was lethal. He was having a lot of success with those power punches. Um I felt that Bivol as well was fantastic. I think he boxed really really well. Um very clever stuff. I felt obviously the judges this the the judge of distance from Bivol was as good as it ever is with him. It's always great. I felt that Bivol went down to the body with some great shots as well. I think his hand speed was causing issues for Baturbiev. I think that um he he was fantastic with you know throwing eye catching combinations and he had a lot of kind of eye catching moments as well in rounds bivol where you'd catch um catch you know Baturbiev lacking I want to say you know when when he uh didn't have his guard up and things like that and they were they were uh eye catching shots there he'd land a few clean in, in in a row there but anyway my scorecard I gave the first four rounds to bivol. Sorry, sorry, uh, let me start again. I gave the first three rounds to Bivol. Um, I gave the fourth for 10-10 because I felt that was a really close round. I then, though, gave the next four rounds in a row to Baturbiev. I gave him round five, six, seven, and eight. I gave round nine and ten to Bivol, and then I gave rounds 11 and 12 to Baturbiev. So, again, I had Bivol up um, by... Uh, one round going into the last two rounds and for me Baturbiev as you said closed the show the stronger of the two he, he certainly for me nicked round 11 and 12 so in the end might be a bit controversial but, but I had Baturbiev 115-114 again there's a 10-10 round in there if you gave that one to Bivol then um, you know then you're looking at a draw um, if I'm not mistaken yeah yeah that would have been a draw yeah that's right that's right yeah 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 so, um, so yeah, like I say, very, very, very uh, close fight. Um, what more can I say? I felt the Bivol box really well, but again, it feels harsh to be sit- sitting here saying, well, I still felt that Baturbi have won the fight, even though Bivol box really well. Um, I just think, like I say, in the late, in the in the second half of the fight, I think Bivol, um did take his foot off the gas a little bit and um again it's it's what you said Eddie I'm going to echo it a little bit you know he he seemed to in a close fight at times just not disappear but he drop his activity a bit there was a few times where he got caught and was potentially hurt and maybe that's why he went into a little bit of a shell sometimes stopped kind of throwing allowed 
allowed Baturbiev to, at that point, dictate the pace, push him backwards and um, have him on the retreat, looking a little bit vulnerable for a while. So, like I say, there were big rounds for Baturbiev. You know, it was clear to score the rounds that he won. And I think the Bivol rounds were um, were closer. But there were a lot of rounds that were close in there as well. So, again, it's very much a what do you like. Um, I don't have too much more to add. But like I say, there's talks already of a rematch, which is great because I'd love to see that again. Um, I would want to see a more clear winner because, again, it's one of those fights where it's close. There's certainly no robbery. If you gave it to Bivol by one or two, I'm not mad at that. If you gave it to Baturbiev by one or two, I'm not mad at that. If you give it a draw, that's that's a good score as well. So... It shouldn't have been wired to either man. I think the 8-4 scorecard from one of the judges was, you know, really a, a terrible scorecard. But, um, yeah, great fight. Would love to see it again. Um, I think both men don't really have loads and loads on their plates either. I mean, what else can either guy do? Um, you know, what's Baturbiev going to do? If he fights Canelo, I suppose that's a more lucrative, you know, opportunity. But other than that, you know, Turkey wants to put it on again. I'm sure he's going to pay them both very, very, very nicely again. Um, I think, yeah, I have a man. I mean, Bivol doesn't really have too much aside from a Canelo rematch, but I don't think it's something Canelo's interested in. Um, and yeah, like I say, but Turbiev doesn't have too much on the table, really. Um, I can't see him fighting like David Benavidez or David Morrell or anything like that. And I think those guys are tied up anyway. Um, so, yeah, there's not too much on the table, really. And I'm not even sure Canelo's going to want a piece of either of them after the other night anyway. So we probably will see the rematch, which is a good thing in a way. You know, it's 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 bad that the winner doesn't have loads and loads of options, I think. But at the same time, I think they're they're both, you know, they're both, their styles gelled. It, it was a very high IQ fight. And I'm not mad at seeing it again. And again, it's someone said it as well. If the second fight's close, we're probably going to get a third fight. It's that kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're, there's that feeling. We could possibly get a trilogy here. And I wouldn't be mad at it. We'll have to wait and see. Anyway, that brings the review part to a close. It's now time to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former two-weight world champion and my favourite female fighter in the world. It is, of course, Miss Chantel Cameron. Chantel, welcome back on the show. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure, my pleasure. So, Chantel, we last spoke back in May. Um, at the time, you just signed with Frank, and you didn't yet have an opponent announced for your first fight under him. You did, of course, wind up fighting Ellen McCallid for the interim WBC Super Lightweight World title. A majority decision win. I'm still not sure yeah. how it ended up being a majority decision. It should have been unanimous. <laughs> yeah, when, the, uh, when that scorecard was read out, I thought, oh, Fucking hell. This isn't the comeback fight that I was wanting, but I'm just glad that the other the other judges seen it my way. But it was a bit of a nerve wracking moment and I thought, Oh God, this is not a good night for me. And you threw eight hundred and eighty punches in the fight, which equates to forty four punches per minute. Uh, you know, that's yeah. that's some work right there. Is that something that you've been working on? Do you know what? Do you want me to be completely honest? I was so ill. I had a sinus and chest infection and I couldn't pull out the fight because it was my comeback fight, my Queensy debut, and it was boxing in Birmingham. So it was one of them where it was I just had to get on with it. So I, I was I woke up on fight day feeling utterly rubbish and I just thought, I've got to get through this and she was such a good opponent and so tough and I've got so much respect for her as well because she come to fight, she come to win, and she was tough as tough as they come. But um, no, to be honest, when when I got told at the end about the stats, I couldn't believe it because I just thought, God, I was just glad to get through that fight. <laughs> um, also, it was your first fight under new trainer Grant Smith. Um, yeah, that, that was. Um... Yeah, that was a little bit of a surprise. That was a bit of a surprise. Tell me about that. How come how come Grant is, is, is the guy you're training with now? You know, it just everyone needs a change at some point and my change was needed and it was need, it was it should have it should have happened sooner maybe, but it, it happened for a reason and uh 
obviously I've, I've achieved a hell of a lot with Jamie and Nigel and I just needed something new and new eyes, something fresh. I was losing the love for the sport. Again, I've been doing it for so long. I've been fighting since the age of 10 and it was time that I spiced it up and made that made that big change. And for my career and for myself, it's the best thing I have made. And I know that I've got a lot of backlash saying oh, this and that, but at the end of the day, I had to, had to do what was best for me and my career. Otherwise, I would have got complacent. I would have got more losses on my record and it would have done me no favours. And on to the next one. You'll be boxing Patricia Berghol on November the 2nd in Birmingham. Yeah. Um, what do we know about Patricia Chantel, aside from, obviously, that fight with Natasha Jonas? Uh, yeah, great amateur. I remember boxing her in the amateurs back in the day. Feels like years ago now. Um, former world champion. And, she, again, she's coming to win. And for me to put put a performance on and remind everyone that I'm chasing down them one forty tiles. I want them back. So for me it's just 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 reminding everyone that I'm I'm coming for them belts. And I wanted to get your reaction as well to a couple of fights. Um, I originally hoped that we would have done this interview sooner so that I could have asked your opinion on the fight kind of before they they took place. But they have now took place, which is no problem. We can kind of uh, review them, if you like. So I wanted to get your reaction to Terry Harper dropping back down in weight. Um, Maybe she was just... Maybe she just moved up, you know, too too much. In my opinion, she probably did. She come back down and dethroned an undefeated champion in Rhiannon Dixon. That was quite something, I felt. Yeah, I was actually at the fight as well. And uh, I'd done rounds with Rhiannon for my fight in July. So um, I was quite, to be fair, good on Terry. I think she's at a natural weight now. I think that weight suits her a lot better than the bigger weights. And... Uh, Again, I just think, do you know what? I, 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 to be honest, I thought Rhiannon was going to get the win because sparring Rhiannon, she's so talented, she's so good, and she hits hard. But I just, I honestly think it's just down to experience, being experienced, and you can't, you can't beat that. You can't beat actual experience. And good on Terry, she performed well, she got the win, and well deserved. And the last time we spoke, you felt that Katie would would be unsuccessful in this rematch with with Amanda Serrano. Do you still feel that way, Chantel? So when I say this, it looks like I'm just being bitter because obviously Katie beat me in the last fight and got the belts and didn't stick to her word about the trilogy when she said in after the fight in front of her home crowd that the only fight for Nets was a trilogy, etc., etc. But just being completely honest and nothing to do with Katie beating me or this and that. I just think Amanda is going to get the win. She's on a most valued promotions card, so Katie doesn't have the match room back in that she's had in previous fights with Delphine Pursuit, etc. And I think the last fight with Amanda, if it was an extra 30 seconds, I think it was the fifth round, I think, Katie would have been stopped. So Amanda's going to come out knowing that she can hurt Katie. And I, I can just, I can, only, I can only see an Amanda win. And obviously, uh, it's up at 140, so it depends on how Amanda's going to fight at 140. I don't think she's ever boxed at 140, I'm not too sure. But that's quite a big jump I can wait for her. But that's the only factor I can see Katie winning, the weight difference. But um, other than that, I just see Amanda Savano because of their last fight. Um, yeah, it's interesting because obviously some people, when they lose to a fighter, they actually go on to say, well, I think that fighter's going to win that fight because it will make the loss not, not look as bad. But um, yeah. you can't win. You can't win sometimes. Like I say, if you no, say... No. And you know what? In, in all honesty, they're both great fighters and it's yeah. going to be a great fight and it's going to be good for the fans and good for women's boxing. But maybe I'm just being biased because I'm a Amanda Serrano fan. <laughs> but I just think... Uh, I, I just think Katie's... I think Katie's best days are done. Yeah, I, I I agree. I tend to agree. Um, Sandy Ryan versus Michaela Mayer took place a couple weekends ago. Did you happen to see that one? If so, what did you think? To be honest, I still haven't watched it. Obviously, it's in New York, and it was on at early hours, and I wanted my sleep because I'm in training camp myself. So I've not got time to actually watch it, but I did see all the commotion and that with paint. But do you know what? I'm actually delighted for Michaela Mayer. Each time she's come to the UK, 
she's had it she's had some rough ends of the stick and she got her world title so you can't help but be happy for her and she got what she's been working on and I'd, I'd like to see her go on and go for undisputed if if the fights are made yeah, it was a really good fight, and um, I did want to make sure you, you definitely weren't in in, in uh, you weren't in town on the twenty seventh of it's September. A, you weren't in New York. I've got a receipt, so I was in England. I'm okay. good. I was okay. I was not out in New York. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if it was me, I wouldn't have been thrown on the legs. He throws paint at legs. It just seems quite bizarre, really. Think about it. if you're going to throw paint, you'd throw it at the upper half. But I don't know. Craziness. Crazy, crazy enough. You sound like you've got experience in paint throwing, Shanta. <laughs> it does. Maybe, maybe take that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Before people keep making accusations. <laughs> okay. Yeah, crazy. Like, he, 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 uh, I don't, and I've seen these things about Michaela Mayer's team being blamed. I just don't think, why would Michaela jeopardise the fight not happening? So, I, I don't think it was her team. Obviously, I don't know. Like, I wasn't there. I don't know her team, et cetera, et cetera, but from a fighter's point of view, why would you jeopardise not fighting that night? Like, if you throw paint at someone, you would throw it at the other half, wouldn't you? Like, or if you threw it at their legs, imagine, like, you are done something to her leg, she'll be injured. So yeah. why would you, why would your team try and ruin the fight? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really make much sense. Um, yeah. I definitely wasn't there, so... <laughs> Okay, as long as we cleared that up. <laughs> just just before we let you go, Chantel, same as always, I'd just like to throw the uh, the microphone back over to you. If you've got any closing words for the listeners before we before we wrap things up, say whatever you like before we let you go. Yeah, thank you to all my sponsors, as always, for sponsoring me and standing by me with back on the journey again to become undisputed again. Obviously, they got, got to the top of the mountain and back now trying to get back up there and get them belts back and also for everyone that's bought tickets to my fight November the 2nd obviously it means the world to me because it's, it's a lot of money to be spending out just coming to Birmingham to watch me fight with Christmas coming up so just thank you to everyone who's bought a ticket and I really really do appreciate it it doesn't go unnoticed excellent word Chantel as always the pleasure is mine thanks so much for your time and we'll speak again soon enough thank you appreciate that Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Just one piece of news to bring you. I think it's probably, um, you know, a fight that we knew was going to be happening. I think it's a, 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 what's the word, worst kept secret in boxing. The Navarrete Valdez rematch to take place on December 7th. So a rematch there between Emmanuel Navarrete and Oscar Valdez. Um, The first fight was a magnificent fight. How can we forget? It's for the... Um, super featherweight world title and on the undercard as well of that we will be seeing um, the the Rafael Espinosa fight against Rabisi Ramirez so I believe those guys are, um, are rematching so um, yeah should be a good fight there again the date for that is December the 7th at the Footprint Center in Phoenix Arizona live on ESPN that's it for the news. Moving on now to the preview part. This one goes down tomorrow at the York Hall Bethnal Green. Um, it's going to be a good card, actually, I think, for a Friday night at York Hall. Um, if you can get down there, I think tickets are not too expensive either on the door. They'll probably have some for sale on the, on, on the door. And also, it's going to be live on TNT Sport. But let's get into the undercard. We're going to see Royston Barney Smith, 11-0. He's stepping in with Carlos Rayo, who's 13-1. That's over eight rounds there at Super Feather. We've got Tommy Fletcher, 8-0 in an eight-rounder. He gets in with Milans Volkovs, who's 10-3 with two draws. We're also going to see this interesting fight here. The undefeated heavyweight prospect Courtney Bennett, 5 and 0, stepping in with Nick Webb, 17 and 3. We had Nick on the show um a couple weeks back now. It, it is for the vacant Southern Area heavyweight title over 10 rounds. I really doubt we're going to hear the final bell there. Nick Webb can bang Courtney Bennett. I don't think is as big a puncher as Nick Webb, but Nick Webb's mad in activity. Um, could could play a factor here. So I don't think we're going to see 10 rounds. Nick Webb's either going to knock him out or just going to probably wind up getting stopped on exhaustion. I'd like to see Nick Webb do well. He's a really nice guy, always has been. 
Uh, and the main event is a really good fight. It's a shame, obviously, that the... I say it's a really good fight. It's, it's a decent fight. It's a shame that we didn't get the original main event. Obviously, it was supposed to be the rematch between Sam Gilly and Louis Green. Unfortunately, Louis Green pulled out with an injury. So, Sam Gilly still fights. He's 17-1. and one. He steps in with Jack McGann, who, of course, got stopped in Saudi to Louis Green. He's 10-1 and one with a draw. It's for the... Commonwealth Super Welterweight title, so I'm pulling for friend of the show, Sam Gilly, to win that one there. Over 12 rounds at Super Welter. Moving now to Saturday at the Copper Box Arena. This one's going to be live on Sky Sports. We are going to have on the undercard return to the ring for Shannon Ryan. She hasn't boxed in about a year and a bit, I think. Oh, sorry, not Shannon Ryan. <laughs> Shannon Courtney. She hasn't boxed for, for, for quite a while. 8-2, and two, former world champion. She is back in a four-rounder here against Catherine Ramos, who's 4-3 and three with a draw. Also on the card, Francesca Hennessy, 4-0, and oh, steps in with the undefeated 5-0. and oh, Anna Carla Vaz de Moraes, who is, like I say, undefeated. So the, the uh, yeah, somebody's own must go, as they say in the game. It's over eight twos. Also on the card, Jamie TKV, 6-1, and one, stepping in with Franklin Ignatius, who is 6-0 and oh with a draw. That's over 10 rounds. Could be interesting there between those two heavyweights. Again, this one's going to be live on Sky Sports. Anthony Yard on the card as well, supposedly. 25-3. and three. He's stepping in with Ralph Vilkans, who's 17-1. and one. This is over 10 rounds here at light heavyweight. Vilkans um, hasn't really boxed anyone. It was a name I had to Google. And, you know, if I've got to Google your name in boxing, it simply means, really and truly, you're either a light flyweight or a minimum weight, or you're not that good. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I know too many boxers in the game. So if I haven't heard of you and I need to actually go and look look at who you are, then that says something in itself. But um, yeah, he's rated in the top 50 on box rec, but we'll have to wait and see what he looks like against Anthony Yard. I'm happy for Yard. I want to see him back out. I, I, I do think he's very capable of winning a world title. I really want to see that fight with him and... Joshua Boatsy, he's working with Boxer on this card here, so that's a step towards that. It seems like he's, you know, he's he's got a decent relationship with Ben Shalom, it would appear. So hopefully we see him come through this unscathed, and you know, who knows? Hopefully the future's bright for Anthony Yard. Friend of the show, good guy. Also on the card, this one's going to be interesting here for the vacant British light heavyweight title. Dan Aziz, 20 and 1 with a draw. Uh, he steps in with the undefeated 9-0 and Lewis Edmondson. Lewis Edmondson in a real big step up. Hasn't really boxed anyone of this level at all as a pro. But, you know, it's not unusual. He's only had nine fights. Dan Aziz has had over double that. But Dan Aziz last time out on that React Poor Billum Smith 2 undercard... He looked awful and barely scraped a draw against a fighter he was supposed to completely, uh, you know, whitewash. So, um, yeah... You know, off the back of that, Lewis Edmondson is now the favourite, the slight favourite with the bookies when I checked earlier on today. So that's interesting. I thought there might have been some decent money to make on Lewis Edmondson, um, but to see him be the favourite was quite surprising. It's now making me think I might just go and back Dan Aziz now. But anyway, Lewis Edmondson was a decent amateur. Should be interesting. Could be a good fight. We've also got another friend of the show, Michael McKinson. He's back in action. He's been sparring boots out there in Philly. He's back in the UK. He is boxing here for the vacant IBO World Welterweight title. He's 26 and 1. We had him on about four weeks ago or three weeks ago. He steps in with South Africa's Talani and Benge. And what's going to be a good fight, I think. He's a tough, strong fighter and very, very capable. Got some good wins on his record. Um, He's not a household name, but a good fighter, a guy that, again, I've known about for several years. He's 20-2. and two. That could be a tough fight for McKinson, but McKinson has the ability to box his ears off, really. McKinson's a tremendous boxer. And the main event in that one, it's going to be interesting. We're going to see Adam Azim, 11-0, back in a 12-rounder here at Super Lightweight, in a bit of a step-up, really, against O'Hara Davies, 25-3. and three. O'Hara Davies, I don't think, has boxed since he got stopped in a shock loss to... Um, to that old guy. Oh man, what's his name? Help me out, Eddie. What's the old guy? You know, the guy who looks really old. Barroso. Oh, uh, Barroso. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you made me remember. I was about to say I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barroso. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, he uh, he got stopped in a round to Barroso, which was a real shock. I think that was like December last year. I don't think he's boxed since then. So the Pookies are expecting Adam Azim to stop him. We'll have to wait and see. Moving now to the final card to mention. It's only one fight, or two fights actually, to mention at the Carib Royale Orlando in Florida, USA. This one's going to be live apparently on Amazon Prime Video. On the undercard, we've got friend of the show, Gary Antonio Russell. He is 19-1. and one. He's back here in a six-rounder at Super Bantamweight against Jaden Bernias, who's 6-2-2. Two and two. Just want to make sure, Gary Antonio Russell, yeah, we have had him on. We've had Gary Antonio, we've had Gary Antoine, and we've had Gary... Alan, who is uh, Gary Russell Jr., of course, former champion of the world. We've had them all on. We've had all three of the Gary Russell fighting brothers on, or at least the ones who still fight. Um, it's hard to keep track of all the Garys in that family. The main event is for the IBF Super Welterweight World title. 22-0, Bakram Murtazaliev stepping in with Tim Su, 24-1. I have to say, I'm, I, I'm not... You know, I'm not too sort of over the moon with this. Tim Su, as we know, last time stepped in with Sebastian Fundora and lost that fight, as we all remember. It was a great fight, but he lost it. He got a bad cut, carried on, and lost the fight. But he jumped straight back in and boxes for a world title in his next fight. No fight in between at all. So he's coming off a loss, fighting for a world title. And that fight with Fundora was for the WBC and WBO. And he's fighting here for the IBF. So, you know, it seems like these sanctioning bodies are bending over backwards to give Tim Su opportunities, which I don't really like. I think, you know, he should have probably had had one or two before stepping in. And he's a big favourite here against the undefeated Russian um, who's based in Oxnard, California these days. But, yeah, again, Murtaz Aliyev, you know, decent fighter. He's, like I say, spent a lot of time in the US, kind of boxed, you know... <sighs> Not that many great fighters. I suppose his his most notable name was his last fight he had. He beat Jack Kalkai, stopped him in the 11th round. But Jack Kalkai is not a great fighter at all. And again, I feel like Tim Su should have way too much for Murtaz Aliyev. Probably end up stopping him. Um, there's not too much to add, like I say. I guess that they just want Tim Su to pick up a world title and jump right back in with, you know, a unification next time or something like that. So we'll have to wait and see, but it's always good watching him fight. I'm not taking nothing away from his ability. He's a great, great fighter. He's elite at 154, but I just think they've, yeah, they've given him an opportunity coming off a loss and it wasn't like, um, it wasn't like it was for the IBF last time. I can understand if the IBF go, okay, it was a close fight. It was contested. Uh, Fundora's vacated the IBF, so let's give Tim Su another opportunity uh, opportunity at it against the next in line guy. I can understand that, but a completely different organization doesn't make much sense. But you know what? It's boxing, and most of the time things just don't make sense anyway. So it is what it is. That's it for the entire talking part of the show. On uh, in part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest. In part two, we did the news. It was just one piece of news. There was barely anything to come to you about in this part two, Eddie, which I'm sorry about. But we've just wrapped up the preview part there. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 470 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive shout out to this week's special guest, the former two weight world champion herself, Miss Chantel Cameron. The biggest thanks, as or every single week, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. That is about everything now from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we'll see you all again same time next week.